start a brand, build an empire. It's the Private Label Podcast. All over the world, there's people building six and seven figure brands, and they're doing it in their basements and their spare bedrooms. And that is really exciting. Knowledge, power, inspiration. I just love the show. It's the right information in the right format. It's perfect. What we're doing here is not just building a business. We're building a brand. And if you do it really well, you are building an empire. The guests are top notch. It's my favorite podcast by far. I don't miss an episode. You see, I'm not the expert, but I can bring the experts to you each and every week on the show. Now, here's your host with another game-changing guest, Kevin Reiser. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Kevin here, and I just want to thank you for joining me today and allowing me to be a small part of your day here at Private Label Podcast. If you're new to the show, make sure you check out the Start Here section over at privatelabelpodcast.com. All right, so today it's a real pleasure to introduce the first ever husband and wife interview that we've done here at the show. After almost 150 episodes, I can't believe this is the first time we've had a husband and wife team on, but that's the case. You know, there are so many of us that have partnerships and a lot of you, that partner is your spouse, your husband, your wife, your significant other. And I've always thought that is really, really cool. Uh, it also takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of willingness to work together, not just inside of your family dynamics, but in a whole new realm, and that's running a business. Today, you're going to meet Garrett and Deanne Akerson, and I've become friends with them over the past year or two, and they're just crushing it. I've always enjoyed watching their family grow right alongside their business. I know you'll enjoy our discussion here today. So please welcome our first ever husband and wife interview, Garrett and Deanne Akerson. Garrett and Deanne, welcome to the Private Label Podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Hey, it is such an honor to have you guys on. I've gotten to know you a little bit over the last year or two. You're members of Zon Squad, and you're just crushing it with your brand. And I was telling you just before we came on, this is the first ever husband and wife interview we've had on the show, which is really, really exciting. I just want to dive right in because I know people will be interested in your story. So tell us how you got started in private labeling. It started... In 2015, I was looking for a change, change in direction. I used to run an advertising agency and wanted to do something different. And I first heard about some re retail arbitrage and didn't think that was quite for me. Having a background in advertising and having done some e-commerce before, the e-commerce route definitely uh, fascinated me. And so I was in the office looking, uh, you know, doing the initial research, looking at what products, what kind of brand we might want to launch. And that's when Deanne walked in. And uh, it, it was one of those things where you're just looking for a certain item and the two kind of situations coalesced where he was looking for something to make and uh, I was looking for uh, something to buy and I said, hey, why don't we make that? Why don't we do that better than it's being done right now? I love it. So you're looking to make a change though, right, Gary? You're, you're looking, is your goal to get out of the nine to five kind of corporate job? I mean, is that is that at the end of the day what you were trying to accomplish or was it more just, hey, we want to supplement the income and have something else to sink our teeth into? No, it was very much... Um, time to make a change. So this was, we started in February of 2015 and I quit in January of 2016. Nice. So, so less than a year. It took us a little less than a year and it was, you know, we've always been about, you know, building this as a brand, as, as something that's long-term, um, something that's, that's large. And so you're, you're looking at products and Dan, you say, you know, why don't we make this instead of just buy it. I mean, where, where did the private label or the physical products aspect of building a brand kind of come onto the horizon? How'd you find out about that? You know, I think initially, Deanne was a little hesitant. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I was. She wasn't quite sure it was going to work. And I had listened to, um, 
I guess I got turned on to the whole private label, like, I don't know, Amazon phenomenon with Brian Moran from mm. uh, The Tribe. And so I had listened to one of his podcasts. I think it was the, you know, 12 months to a million. And I've started probably three or four companies in the past. So I'm not a stranger to new startups. And I said, wow, this is, this is a, this is a great idea, you know, and if Ryan can do it, I can do it. I, I'm, a, I'm always a believer. In. <laughs> I love you that. look at somebody else doing it and you say, if they can do it, I can do it. Then you start hearing the stories. Right. I mean, it is inspiring. It's one of the reasons that I wanted to start this show is I too, Garrett, am, am inspired and, and really take a lot of stock in seeing that someone else has been successful at something and and then kind of bolstering my feeling that I can be successful. But Deanne, your story is just as important because there's also oftentimes that doubt or that lingering questioning of, I'm not sure if this will really work. So tell us about your feelings early on. Yeah, I was not born an entrepreneur. Um, I definitely married one. <laughs> and that was uh, something I had to adjust to. I had the most traditional, stable career as a high school math teacher you can imagine. Mm. And um, it wasn't until we had our second son and I decided I wanted to stay home that we you know, were looking at ways to reinvent our life because I didn't want to go back to the classroom every day. And, but I was still, I had to be sold on it. He had me listen to the podcast, you know, 12 months to a million. And there was a lot of self-doubt. I mean, a lot. I don't think I truly got on board with it until about, about four months into the process. Like I had to have the product here and actually have something in my hands to wrap my, my head around. Like it, it took a while for me to understand. And really it was probably not until we made our first actual sale that wasn't discounted or promoted that I remember looking at Garrett, checking our, our, our Amazon app on the phone. I held up my phone. I was like, look, someone bought one. today." <laughs> <laughs> That's the ultimate proof in the pudding, right? Is that that first organic sale that didn't come as a result of any type of uh, coercion or, or incentive incentivization or anything like that. So right. how, how did you guys get to the point where you, you were at least comfortable enough to take that first step? I mean, what was the bargaining like or the agreement? Was it, we're going to try this for a while and see if it works? How did, how did that look? Well, we had to put in the, the initial amount of the investment. I, I knew it couldn't be enough that would completely bankrupt us. Like yeah. I was willing to go in, but I wasn't willing to, you know, sell our house for it or, you know, I was in, but it was, it was guarded. And I had to experience a little bit of success initially with that first, um, you know, that first purchase before I was willing to go in bigger. Now the stakes are obviously much bigger, um, but I've also seen much larger proof too. Right. So, so I think this is this story and, and this ability to have both of you on is is so um, really advantageous because there's a lot of couples. I promise, or, or at least one half of a lot of couples listening to the show right now. Garrett, what would you say or the, th the advice that you would have? Maybe someone's listening and their husband's not fully on board or their wife's not on board. I would imagine there was a lot of communication early on and back and forth and trying to get Deanne to the point where she was comfortable at least giving this a go. What would be your advice to someone in that situation? Wow, yeah. Uh, like Deanne said, I've, I've always had the entrepreneurial streak, so it's easy for me to start things. And I think the big takeaway was patience. I had to be patient. We, our brand, um, we're in the, the clothing space and apparel. And so it was very much a, a mom driven brand. So I needed, like, it, it was a partnership from the very beginning. And we had some difficult conversations, you know, and, and like Deanne said, in that first three to four months, I think I came to Deanne at one point as was, was like, you know, look, I need you on like, on board 100%. I can't do this without you, particularly with her knowledge, because we didn't, in many ways, we didn't do the typical private label route. Like we didn't private label something. We said, okay, here's what's selling. And then we went back and Deanne designed her own and had it manufactured. So it's, it's very unique. It wasn't something we just put our brand on. So it had to have all that input from her. Um, and I think that's really what's made us successful is, is certainly the two of us working together. Deanne from the, the brand 
at, from building the product and then looking at it and, and saying, you know, this is, this is what I would want. Because it was very much our stage in life is, is what this came out of. And so, yeah, I would say really it was patience and, you know, just being open, communicating with each other. And then, you know, know your spouse. For Deanna, it did take a, a while. It took proof. And our first product didn't do that well. I mean, to be honest. We, we barely broke even. Uh, Deanna was looking at me after the first product going, I don't know if this is going to work. And, I, <laughs> and I, was still, I was still 100% no, this is, we're going to make this work. So I was like, wait, if that didn't, that product didn't work, well, we got to launch something here. So we stayed in the same niche, but we, you know, we launched our second product and that's when things really took off. But adding on to that, I think um, what really helped him to convince me to be all in and be supportive is we had to divide the duties and I had to actually take over certain areas where I was responsible. Um, otherwise, if it was him running everything and me just kind of like giving advice here and there, I would have never been all in. It wasn't until I actually, like we divided the duties and I was in charge of, you know, these aspects of the business. That's when I truly got on board. Yeah. We're I love that. Much, yeah. I think That's it's so true. important too, right? I mean, not just with the husband and wife team, but with any team is for it to be a true partnership each partner, each person has to have ownership of things to feel like uh, they're, they're really, you know, a part of the team, right? So my question is, how did you divide those roles? Was it things that you naturally were better at versus, or, or was, was it just, okay, you're going to take this and I'm going to take that? It was a little bit of both. I mean, there were definitely some areas where He's naturally more inclined to do, you know, all the software tools, um, and I'm much more inclined to work with the actual product innovation and the, the suppliers. So that was a very easy, easy division. But um, then other things we just picked and said, look, you, you've got a lot going on. Why don't I take the logistics? And, you know, there's been a little shifting here and there, too. So in a lot yeah. of teams, you know, one person is the more creative mind. Another person is more analytical, more data-driven and numbers-driven. Does it break that way for you guys? Mm, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I think we both um, are pretty analytical. He enjoys the, the using the tools um, it more than I do on the computer. But as far as, you know, looking at numbers, I... I'm a former math teacher, so that it. I, I pretty good with that. numbers. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think the difference there is we looked at, you know, we kind of did that whole, you do the huge map, you put it all up. In fact, we put it on our kids' easel here. Yeah. <laughs> it's still behind us. I can look back and see it right now. And we just put down everything that had to be done. And then we kind of, you know, circled, okay, you take care of this chunk, you take care of this chunk. And my background in, is in, you know, marketing and advertising. So, I took more of those sections. Deanne took more of the product design and development sections. You mentioned that you guys designed a product from scratch and, and are improved upon an existing design. Did you know right away that's what you wanted to do as opposed to the more traditional product selection? No, that was kind of the bit where I was just shopping for a certain product and kind of stumbled into the idea. You know, I'd ordered half a different, half a dozen different ones and just couldn't find exactly what I was looking for. And then the idea came, well, if I took this aspect of this one and, you know, this one of that one, I, I could, you know, create what in my mind it was the perfect product. Nice. So talk us through that process a little bit, Deanne. That's definitely a more complex and longer process than most of us as private labelers do. It's not as simple as going to Alibaba and interacting with a manufacturer give us the highlights of designing a, you know, a product and then having it manufactured the very first one was not all that different than just private labeling i i had a, a product in mind and when i went in and i did find my first suppliers on alibaba um since then i've, I've learned some trade shows i can go to to meet them as well but i i I, I contacted them, told them what I was looking for, the, the key, you know, the key things I wanted to improve on. And, you know, then they sent me samples back and it ended up not being a hard decision. Uh, one, one supplier sent me something that was like awful. I actually took it out of the package and I, I, I put it in the trash. afterwards. <laughs> it was so bad. I didn't even want to donate it. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> And then we went with the other one. 
So, um, like the, the very first product didn't have an enormous amount of innovation. It just had a few things where I wanted to improve. And I was able to communicate that to the supplier just in words. You know, I said, I, I want to improve this feature of the product. Uh, and, and they, they got what I was look, what I was looking for. Uh, since then, you know, the, the designing my own products, it just comes down to more time, more time and sampling. I send, well, first, you know, I send emails with words. I'll also send photographs, sketches, um, sometimes physical products, you know, via DHL to them. So the sampling process can take a long time. It can take six weeks or more right. to start the order. And how are you coming a across these differentiations, these improvements? Is it just through your own experience or what type of research are you doing to find out what you want to improve upon? Um, well, it is number one, um, how I think the product could be improved. I've learned for better or for worse that I'm actually not that unique or unusual. And so if there's some way that I'm using um, a product and you know see its limitations or where it could be better, chances are there's a lot of other people who feel the same way. Um, so that's my first thing. I do trust my instincts, but then I validate them by reading lots of reviews. I look at the reviews of similar items and I just look for ways that other people also have been dissatisfied with products. So I spend plenty of time reading one, two and three star reviews. Yeah, that's definitely a great way for some good feedback. Now, Garrett, you said that the first product wasn't a runaway success. Tell us about that. No, it wasn't. I, I mean, if, you know, if you're familiar with uh, the grind, as we like to call it, where you're trying to get to the, you know, that 20, 20 sales a day, it, it never hit it. It still hasn't to this day. I think maybe we do 15 on a given day. And it was just due to demand. So, I mean, back when we started, it's amazing how much it's changed. There were no software tools. I was, I was <laughs> using Excel and looking at BSR and, <laughs> and, and, you know, doing all those kind of back of the napkin estimates, like, okay, if it's this, I think it'll probably sell this. So things have come a long way and it just, you know, it had a, a, a BSR that just didn't have the volume behind it. So that was, it. it was the volume. What were the takeaways? What things did you implement as you look towards your second product and then beyond? What were the changes you made to kind of the, the approach that you took to product sourcing based on that first initial experience? So I, I swung the other way. I said, I'm going to look at something that's in, you know, the top 100 or the top 200. I would rather, I would rather more competition than less um, because I know the volume's there. And if the volume's there, I, I don't even have to be, you know, number one, as long as you can get to, you know, that, that first page, you're going to see the sales. Interesting. And, is, that, is that an approach that you're still with to this day? I mean, you still go after those higher competition type of products? No, now we're mo much more brand focused. So we're looking at building out our portfolio of products. And so, you know, while we do look at it for which products we're going to launch sequentially, it actually doesn't have as much bearing on, on products that we're going to launch now. So once you swung for the fences and you said, okay, I'm going after the, the, I'm going where the fruit is, where the sales are. I mean, was it that second product that really took off? And how long of a process was that from product one to product two? Product one started selling June 6, 2015. 16. Oh, yeah. 15. 15. Yeah. And then the second product we launched in October of 2015. So that's, you know, five months, uh, five months later. And was the second one the one that really gave you some sea legs? It, it got you comfortable with the fact that this was really going to work? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's the one that was like, wow. That's the, that's the one that made Deanne comfortable, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the one that turned Deanne into full-time. Nice. That's the one that actually allowed Garrett to quit his day job. Um, that's the part we haven't talked about where you're doing all this work and you're still not able to, like, take home a paycheck from it we still don't take a home a paycheck yeah. a little <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a great point Deanne, and a lot of people don't focus on that you know my friend brian krieger famously ran his private label brand for two almost three years before he left his corporate job you have a little bit shorter trajectory but certainly there was a lot of long nights and 
early mornings running the the new fledgling brand um, while you're still working your day job, right? Yeah, it was it was long. That, that working two jobs part was exhausting, and I don't think we could have lasted very much longer at it. So I'm really glad that our second product gave us uh, enough confidence and capital to work with so that Garrett didn't have to keep working the day job. What were the one things you look, what are two things, Garrett, as you look back at that experience that at, at DAU2 that kind of pulled you through it? I mean, even though it was tough and you said, we're glad we didn't have to do it any longer than we did, how did you make it through that? I would say the goal, I mean, it was, work was, was a bit rough. And, you know, you add to that, you know, work eight, nine hour days, come home, spend a few hours. We have a young family. I mean, our, our kids are two and five. So spend time with the family and then, you know, go to work after everyone's asleep, work till midnight and wake up again at, you know, 6 a.m. or whenever the kids get up and it starts getting long. So it was, it, at first it was just like, this is the date that we're quitting by or I'm quitting by and we're going to make it happen by then. And and we saved up as much as we could as well. I mean, we were very frugal. So you actually I, set that date on a calendar, huh? We had a date, and we actually didn't stick to the date completely. It did have to get pushed out, not a ton, maybe six weeks, two months. But by the time that date came, we could see that we were moving toward it, and that was enough That was enough affirmation you know, to be able to, to, get, to wait until it really was the right time to quit. Yeah. So, Diad, what were the things for you? I mean, obviously, you had some skepticism in the early uh, months. You wanted to to kind of see this this thing proven out. But what was what were the goals for you? I mean, for Garrett, it was it was to get away from this nine to five job to do something he enjoys more. What about from your perspective as a spouse, as a mom? What were the things you were hoping that this new business would create for you guys as a family? I was hoping that this would allow us to both parent and work as a team, like a partnership. We've always worked together better than separately. And um, even when our first son was born, I went back to school to teaching um, to teaching math halftime. And Garrett was a consultant at that point. So he would mirror my schedule. On the days that I was teaching, he would stay home with our, our oldest son. Mm. And, I would, and then vice versa. But when it came to the point when I had two kids and I was staying home alone with both of them, it just didn't feel like the right dynamic for our family where I was home completely isolated with the kids all day. And he was at work, sometimes not even getting home until they were almost in bed. So my goal for the whole thing was to just reinvent our whole family, like our whole life. And I wanted it to be a partnership in, a, in as many aspects as possible. So from parenting together to working together, um, I just, I just wanted us to overlap again, instead of like living these separate, but parallel lives. I love that. And I think a lot of the audience will relate to those goals and those desires, you know, for so many of us, it is something related to the family in terms of desire. I mean, money is great, right? But it, you can only do so much with it. If that money is not allow you to do something more with the people that you care about, then it's, uh, it's just not quite as special. I want you both to think back to the time around the second product taking off and you start to feel more comfortable about it. Think back. I want, I want you to share with us, if you can, maybe a struggle or a road, a road bump, if you will, uh, sub, something that, uh, that happened that you had to overcome and, and a difficulty in the business. Anything like that? We've had a lot of road bumps for sure. Um, who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> over Anything that sticks out is is like a, a real challenge early on in the business that you had to I overcome. Mean, I would say the first challenge was that first product. I think a lot of people would get discouraged. It's pretty easy to launch a product and just not. It's not going to do anything. I mean, you can't just. It's not just launch a product and you're going to reap rewards, particularly if it's you know low competition and, and just low volume. Um, so that was a little bit like. Okay, is this really going to work? We had some doubts there, and then I'd say probably the second big one was the maybe the manufacturing. Issues yeah, we had we had, um, we had a, a, uh, an error where the spec it, the product didn't turn out to specifications, and it really impacted 
like our ability to sell it and, um, you know, cash being tied up. And it was, it was just kind of a, a general, general overall disaster mm. that we had to work through. But looking back, it helped us to put in a lot more systems in place that should have been in place, like a purchase order that was really specific with tolerances, with, um, you know, as much information as possible right there at the beginning. You know, before I was just emailing my orders in and I didn't really have like even something as simple as a purchase order. Um, it, re it had me start working with an inspection team. Uh, locally in Asia, I've used uh, Asia Inspection, also VTrust, also Intertech for inspections. And uh, so, like, the things it caused us to do were positive. And, you know, the amount that we actually lost in that, that first little snafu isn't enormous. So, but at the time, it, it was definitely um, a headache. I mean, no, it was more than a headache at the time. It, it was worse than that. But yeah. I mean, looking back, it seems like it was a headache. It was bad. <laughs> I, I love the learning lessons, though, that you just shared there, Deanne. One one follow up question about your purchase orders. Now you mentioned tolerances. What what do you what do you mean by tolerances? How does that work? It's like what I'm willing to accept. Like here's the standard for my product, and that can mean like dimensions, weight, um, you know, how it actually works to what you're you, what you will allow. Because nothing can be manufactured exactly the same. Like there's always going to be a certain amount of margin of error, no matter what you're making. I don't care what you're making. Um, there are tolerances involved, and you know, depending on the kinds of either people or machines that are assembling it, you have to state what it is you're willing to accept, and your your supplier will tell you what a reasonable tolerance is that they can achieve. They can tell you what it is, and then put it into your purchase order. And then it's very clear when it comes um, to inspection time. And I've learned also not to wait until it's done to inspect, but to inspect at the beginning. Inspect when it's like between 10 and 30% completed, and then you have time still to change course. Yeah, great advice there from Garrett and Deanne on uh, being really upfront, really clear with your suppliers, with your vendors on quality standards and what it is exactly that you're expecting to receive in exchange for your purchase. And also on inspecting, all of us should be inspecting products, particularly, um, well, especially those first few orders, but as an ongoing part of quality control as well. Okay, so product number two is off to the races. It gives you enough comfort to have Garrett come home and, and work full time in the business. Everything's going well. What do you guys do next? Is it just rinse and repeat? Yeah, and grow, grow bigger, grow more products. <laughs> What was the strategy? Was it to go wide or to go deep? I mean, you, did you at that point look for complementary products or was it just about expanding that current, that current product? Yeah. I wanted to go wide. I mean, it's more, it's much more fascinating to me to continue to bring in new things. So that was, um, that was my goal. Um, so we, we did this year, we were up to 12 products now. Nice. 12 products at this point, and they are all under the same brand? Yes. Yeah. Very cool. And have any of them kind of surpassed that product number two? Have you continued to find that sub perform better than others, or, or what does that look like? You know, product number two is still our best seller. That one runs out of stock. I mean, so since then, I think our largest issues this year have been, and you'll find this out quickly when you really start growing is cash flow. Mm. Um, cash flow has been a huge issue and inventory control and management. I mean, we, our second product has run out of stock so many times we should be fired. <laughs> 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 Was that surprising to you guys at all? I mean, I, I had the illusion when I got into this, that all of my problems would go away when I hit a certain amount of sales. And in the early days, I was probably thinking, okay, if I could ever get to $50,000 a month in sales or $100,000 a month in sales, I can't imagine how I could have any problems because I could solve them instantly with those sales, right? But we find out, and, and to me, this was surprising that your your problems don't go away. And in some ways, they become bigger, uh, bigger. The, the more you grow, right? Yeah, much bigger. I, I did not expect that either. I mean, you hear it, I think, in passing, but not talked about often, like starting a physical products business eats up a lot of cash mm -hmm. in particular. 
And, um, you know, so now we're approaching the 180,000 a month mark. And so it's just bigger bills. Like it just eats up more and more. Um, and now it's not enough where you can just go draw on your personal bank account to, you know, meet that month's cash flow needs if you need to. Um, particularly when, you know, we just launched nine new products in a pretty short sequence. So I think that put the most stress on us recently. And that cash flow is a very common concern among sellers, kind of where you guys are at right now. How have you met some of those challenges? Are you still kind of navigating that? We're definitely still navigating it. Um, but we've, you know, we've maxed um, all the different resources we can tap into in terms of <laughs> cash we can get our hands on. Like they say. Friends, family, and fools. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. And, you know, I, I guess, I mean, it's important to put it into context, right? These are good problems to have. Yeah. Uh, any yeah. day of the week, I'd rather have a problem of trying to find money to fund inventory for a product that's moving really well, as opposed to trying to revive a brand that uh, has seen sales plummet, for example, or trying to meet cash flow or meet payroll for a, a brand that's suffering. So these are good problems to have, but they are uh, problems that are out there. The other thing that surprised me, I'm curious as to whether you guys experienced this, but you know, there's a, a lag of somewhere between three to six, maybe nine months in some cases with the product before you really start to be able to pull anything out of that, right? Because as it grows, you're just pumping every dollar back into larger and larger inventory orders. So uh -huh. even though the product may be selling like gangbusters, you're not really seeing that, that, that money yet. No, no, we're exactly in that spot that you're describing. Yeah. I mean, and, and Deanne said we do take a little money out now, but I, you know, I want to say we take out like 5,000 a month, whatever it takes to live on bare minimum. Yeah. The rest just goes right back into inventory and growth. So let's talk about structure and, and organization and daily operations. At this point, I would imagine you've got some people kind of helping you with various tasks and that type of thing. It's not just you two hammering away, doing it all alone, right? Right. We hired our first employee before we took um, a one-month trip to China, um, and that was customer service. I think that's one of the first things that people usually higher away. Nice. So, uh, and it's, a, that's a part-time position, probably 10, 12, 15 hours a week at the most. And then, um, our first full-time hire was this summer in June. Um, you can talk about that one. Yeah. So our, our first and second full-time hire. So now we're up to three employees plus the two of us. And our first hire was, um, somebody we hired to take over more of the Amazon channel management so we could build out our, our e-commerce sales through our Shopify site more, which is really where we're focused more now. And this, uh, this, this person is local or are they overseas? Uh, so local, this was somebody that I had worked with before and, and, you know, you kind of meet those individuals where you say, man, if I ever start, at least for me, I, I'm always looking like if I ever start a company, I'm going to hire that person. Like right. here's my all, here's my all-star team. And so, you were able to bring them on board. Talk about what that's done for you, Garrett, the last few months. Has it freed up you know, time and energy and, and headspace to be more creative or to focus your efforts elsewhere? Actually, I think it's probably done the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> So you always think like, oh, this is great. We're growing. We're going to hire some employees. And, you know, this is a U.S.-based employee. And she's amazing. I knew she was amazing before we hired her. But it doesn't matter who you hire. I would say 80% of my time for the first 90 days. She's past 90 days now. So, yeah, it has, it has started to shift. But those first 90 days in particular, I, that's like 80% of your time if you're doing it right is all that just basically you have to – train that person and put in all those systems in place and divulge all of this information that's just stuck in your head. Um, that's, yeah, it just eats up all your time. So I think we're just now starting to see the, the change where he, he has more time to, to work on, on, you know, leading in our, our brand and our business instead of just the daily like grind of tasks. Right. I think it's an important point and one that's often overlooked when it comes to outsourcing or hiring 
is that it's an investment, right? It's not an immediate return. As you said, if you do it properly, you're training that person, you're looking for ways to improve, you're putting in place processes and systems. So it is an investment. And oftentimes it is some time before you start to see that, uh, that return. So you brought up something interesting, which is focusing on other channels outside of Amazon, something I think every wise entrepreneur, every private label brand owner at this point should be doing or should at least be starting to think about. Uh, at what point did you guys know or did you know from day one that that was going to be part of the strategy? We knew from day one. Um, we, we, we were all about not just starting a lifestyle business, but you know, building a brand that we can build to 10, 20, 30 million maybe even a hundred million someday. So from day one, we had an e-commerce store that was up and running. I felt like it helped, um, you know, bring some legitimacy to our brand as well. Because if somebody finds your brand on Amazon and they Google you and there's nothing, then that's not very good. So. Right. So in the early days though, it probably wasn't as much of a focus. It's now become more of a focus what types of things do you guys do to drive traffic and sales on your Shopify storefront as opposed to the sales that you generate on Amazon? I would say 90% of our traffic is all driven through Facebook. I mean, Facebook is just phenomenal now for being able to target, micro-target, and I think for e-commerce, it's certainly the platform right now. Um, Instagram, we tried Instagram and the ROI just hasn't been there. Mm. And, you know, I, I'm Google certified, so I've run multiple AdWords campaigns before on the Google search side and worked in SEO and all of those. I mean, not to discount them, and we do use Google AdWords as well, but Facebook is just so much more powerful, at least in, in our case, for targeting our, our, our audience. Is that stuff you've been able to manage on your own or have you reached out for help? Do you have somebody kind of managing those ads? That is something I've done internally. So going in and building out all of your custom audiences and your retargeting and, and all of that is we've done that all in house. We do have help writing content. So, you know, we have a blogger that we work with and we have um, someone who does a lot of our social media posts for us. Um, but as far as all the promotion and advertising and targeting, that's, that's been me up to this point. Nice. And so any exploration beyond Shopify at this point, are you on other platforms? Is that part of your strategy going forward? No, not anytime soon. I, you know, one channel at a time, I think Amazon where we've got pretty dialed in and the, you know, our next channel is and entirely focused on on Shopify and, and the e-commerce there. We've talked about doing brick and mortar, but I just I don't think you need to. I mean, you can grow a brand easily to ten million a year just through e-commerce built on Amazon and Shopify. Very nice, guys. This has been so so enjoyable. So many golden nuggets. I want to get into now our Empire Builders round, and then talk about some of your goals for the future. Let's take it up a notch. It's time for the Empire Builders Round. All right, first question. Is there a book that you have read that's had an impact on either your personal life, your business, or both? Did you think of one to ask? No. <laughs> <laughs> I would, man, there's so many good ones. I would say The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Great one. The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle is... Garrett's recommended read and Empire Builders. If you'd like to check that out or any other book for that matter, just go to privatelabelpodcast.com slash book. And our friends over at Audible will gift you a free audio book download. All right, next question. Is there a tool you're using right now in your business that you can recommend to us? You know, we're just starting to see some great results from Facebook video. It's been talked about a lot. Um, so we kept wanting to do it. So we just um, are in the middle of launching uh, a couple different campaigns using video and retargeting on Facebook. And uh, we've actually been working with a company, Watchfire Films, um, which is actually um, a relative of ours. It's my brother-in-law, Deanne's sister's husband, who is a documentary filmmaker. So he's uh, been doing, did these initial videos for us where we can 
We've got our customers to do genuine customer reviews. Nice. They're just amazing and authentic. And then he did an interview, a founder interview with Deanne, her talking. Um, and Facebook, video on Facebook is just killing it. So I think that's our, our number one tool now for building our off Amazon sales. I love it. I definitely want to check out Watchfire Films. I'm sure others will as well. And I love the idea about the authentic video testimonials. I can only imagine how powerful those would be. Empire Builders, for a link to find out more about Facebook video or Watch Watchfire Films, anything else we've discussed on today's show, just go to the show notes section on the episodes tab over at privatelabelpodcast.com. All right, guys, final question. If the audience listening to us right now takes only one thing away from our discussion here today, what would you hope that would be? Garrett, let's start with you, and then we'll go to DN. Oh, boy. One thing. You can do it. You just got to stick to it. You can do anything. I, I think it's, you know, I've, I've heard Jeff Hoffman say and many other entrepreneurs, you have to be the type where you look at somebody and say, if that person did it, I can do it. And you just set your mind to it and figure out a way. And so there's one thing we like to say to each other um, oft repeated in, in our household. There are no problems, only puzzles. Mm, I love that. Such great advice. Deanne, any more thoughts? Yeah, I would, I would echo the advice to stick with it. Um, most things in life don't come quick or easy. So it takes a certain amount of resolve and persistence. And, you know, when you're in that space of having to persist, it can be helpful um, to, and I heard this um, at a conference last year I was at, but to look forward and measure backwards. So instead of, you know, comparing yourself to other people that you want to be or, you know, business or brand, look where you were a year ago or, you know, six months ago and let that fuel you as you persist and, you know, keep working hard to get to the next level. So. Great timeless advice there. Stick with it and, and look forward and measure backward. You know, I got an email from a listener just this morning who was kind of skeptical about not just uh, me or the podcast, but just this whole industry that we're all a part of as a whole. He said, I, it sounds like a bunch of get rich quick stuff to me. And I couldn't help but laugh as I read the email before I responded because it's anything but get rich or quick. Uh, and I thought of all the many people, the many hardworking people, the brand owners that I know and that I'm privileged to get to know. And you guys are, are an embodiment of that. It's not about getting rich quick. It's about lots of diligent hard work and effort and doing the right thing over and over again long enough to see the results that you experience. You guys are just the best of the best. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing with us today. Oh, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. It was fun. All right, so what did you think of Garrett and Deanne's story? I tell you what, just so cool to see the way that they work together as a team, not only with raising their family and all the cool stuff they're doing there, but how they channel those same synergies and just an incredible work ethic and respect and admiration for each other and just crushing it in business. I'd love to know your thoughts, and you can leave those for me in the show notes section on the episodes tab over at privatelabelpodcast.com. If you're looking for actionable tips and tricks to get into your own private label business or to take your business to new heights, don't miss an episode of the Private Label Podcast's Listen and Learn. Each Wednesday, we'll tackle a topic to enhance and improve your private label business building skills. Look for new episodes each and every Wednesday and check them all out online along with video tutorials and downloadable PDFs at privatelabelpodcast.com.